this book is extraordinary. He's this this guy, John Taylor Gatto. Uh, one, let's see, I did not go back and think about his biography. Uh, he, he's he's since died, but he won, I think, New York State's Teacher of the Year award at least once, and he was a teacher for decades in the New York um, public school system, and he railed against the the destruction of children through schooling. So yeah. both, but all of those things are true, and he says here. Um, Oh, let me just say one more thing about the book, though. So I, I recommend this book very, very highly. He does, unfortunately, like Robin DiAngelo in White Fragility, uh, misunderstand, like many good liberals with no background in science and specifically no background in evolutionary thinking, conflate social Darwinism with an evolutionary understanding of human behavior. So there's that's a bit irritating in the beginning of the book if you do read his sort of history of uh, compulsory education. Uh, but other than that, I find little to disagree with here. So he says... Let me tell you a little bit about Fat Stanley, whose path crossed mine when he was 13. Stanley only came to class one or two days a month, and I knew that sooner or later he would be caught in the truancy net and prosecuted. I liked Stanley, not least because he never whined when other kids bothered him because he was fat. He simply punched them so hard in the head nobody ever bothered Stanley a second time. <laughs> I hope to spare him the grim experience of becoming a social service case, uh, as Grace became a social service case. So I asked him one day what he did on all those absences. What he said changed my life. I never saw school the same way after Stanley spoke. It seems that Stanley had five aunts and uncles, all in business for themselves before the age of 21. His aim was to follow in their footsteps. Even at 13, he had been made aware of time's winged chariot hurrying near, that he had only eight years to make the miracle of an independent livelihood. One of the relatives was a florist, one a builder of unfinished furniture, one a deli owner, one had a little restaurant, one owned a delivery service. Stanley cut school to work without pay for each of these relatives, bartering labor in exchange for learning the businesses and a whole lot more, working in the company of men and women who cared for him much more than any professional stranger would have. It was a better educational package than whatever he missed cutting school, hands down. As he put it to me, man to man, quote, this way I get a chance to see how the different businesses work. You tell me what books I have to read and I'll read them, but I don't have time to waste in school unless I want to end up like you, working for somebody else. When I heard that, I couldn't keep him locked up in good conscience. Besides, his mother agreed with Stanley. So I began to cover for him, logging him present when he was marking floral bouquets or building furniture. None of his other teachers ever asked. I think they were glad to be rid of him. To illustrate the powerful energies at work under his fat, deceptively cheerful exterior, Stanley crossed his T's with a pointed spear formation, not a simple line. Right then and there, I adopted his T cross as my own to remind me what I learned from a truant that day. A big secret of bulk process schooling is that, is that it doesn't teach the way children learn. A bigger secret is that it isn't supposed to teach self-direction at all. Stanley's style is verboten. School is about learning to wait your turn, however long it takes to come, if ever. And how to submit with a show of enthusiasm to the judgment of strangers, even if they are wrong, even if your enthusiasm is phony. School is the first impression we get of organized society and its relentless need to rank everyone on a scale of winners and losers. Like most first impressions, the real things school teaches about your place in the social order last a lifetime for most of us. Work in classrooms isn't important work. It fails to speak to real needs pressing on the young. It doesn't answer burning questions which day-to-day -day experience forces upon young minds. Problems encountered outside school walls are treated as peripheral, when in truth they are always central. The net effect of making work abstract, subject-centered, external to individual longings and fears and experiences and questions is to render students of this enforced irrelevance listless and indifferent. The causes for sluggishness in the young have been well understood for a long time, I'm tempted to say forever. Growth and self-mastery are reserved for those who vigorously self-direct, like Stanley, planning, doing, creating, reflecting, freely associating, taking chances, punching the lights out on your tormentors. But this is the, precisely the agenda school is set up to prevent. Think of school as a conditioning laboratory, drilling naturally unique, one-of-a-kind individuals to respond as a mass, to accept continual ennui, envy, and limited competence as only natural parts of the human condition. The official economy we have constructed demands constantly renewed supplies of leveled, spiritless, passive, anxious, friendless, familyless people who can be scrapped and replaced endlessly, and who will perform at maximum efficiency until their own time comes to be scrapped. People who think the difference between Coke and Pepsi or round hamburgers versus square ones are subjects worthy of argument. <laughs> Reminds me of uh, George Carlin saying that the purpose of school was to make you just smart enough to operate the machines. Um, yeah, there's a lot. I, I can't, I mean, you know how much I resonate with 
yeah. with that. I will say in my case, um, the teachers and professors who figured out a way to cover for me and break the rules for me were the ones that were the whole reason I was able to get through school. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you know, in the end, my advisor, Dick Alexander was the ultimate one of these. So, <laughs> um, one day I, I had to get a signature of his, I went out to the, the, the ranch that he lived on farm. It was, it was yeah. It was a working farm, yeah. right? He bailed his own hay and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I biked out there. It was a long way. I biked out there with my um, form to say that I had had a committee meeting this year, which I hadn't. Um, and, of course you hadn't. Um, I biked out there and I got off my bike and I walked up to the, the fence of the paddock and he rode over on his horse. <laughs> and uh, but He was an old guy already at that oh, point. Yeah. yeah, he was at least in his 70s. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I said, I need your signature, Dick. And he says, oh, well, what's this for him? I, I said, it, uh, it says I had a committee meeting this year. And he said, is this the meeting? <laughs> 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 Which, I mean, that was classic. Yep. But anyway. And, and, and it, it, you know, less people misunderstand the story. It's not that you weren't constantly engaging with him and with your peers, our colleagues, and the other faculty and all of this. You just, you, you didn't, you didn't do it by form. You didn't do it formulaically. I couldn't. You didn't have. do it as you were supposed to. I didn't do it as I was supposed to. Yeah. I didn't even, I, you know, my dissertation didn't end up on the topic I was supposed to be working on, but it did end no up. No bats at all. Important. Yeah, the bats don't show up in it. Mm -hmm. But, um, but, you know, yeah, you're right. It's not like I didn't do something useful. It's not like I didn't, it just, the, the regular rules weren't going to work. And he knew that. He appreciated, you know, although he was very good at the rules in a way that I never could have been. Mm -hmm. Um, he also just spotted that some people don't fit them and it's mm -hmm. worth bending rules for those people sometimes. So, yeah, I will say, um, I mean, this is probably not the place, but so this was at university of Michigan where we both got our PhDs and, um, you know, I'd always had a, a, a lovely time in school, but I didn't have any biology background uh, until we met Bob Trivers, um, late in college, whereas you had been doing biology since you could walk basically um but had always had a completely lousy time in school and basically needed nothing more than to be left alone by it uh and so you know we had very different experiences walking into that system and i'm you know i i know i've, I've seen evidence that the university of michigan which um was really the the first public um, the, the first public university system in the United States that tried to become a premier, you know, an elite university system, and it, and it did. Um, but they, it managed, at least that department, Department of Biology then, and the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology managed to uh, find ways to laud both of us with our very different approaches to, and, and backgrounds and skill sets and all of this. You know, we, bo we both won um, each of us won different of their highest awards that they had to offer for the work that we did there. And, you know, to their credit that an institution could see both someone coming in with almost no background who needed to self-teach and teach on and learn on the fly, but who, but who loved school and someone who had tremendous background, but no ability to play by the rules. And you were always mistaken for someone who refused to play by the rules. And to some degree, that's true. But to some degree, it was also just, guys, I, I just can't do this. Right? Well, right. The yeah. rules don't make sense. Yeah. You know, they do make sense for this kind of regimented training thing. It's not how you train people to discover new stuff. And so, you know, that's, I mean, the people who broke the rules on my behalf or bent them, it's not like they weren't frustrated with me. Right. But they also oh, understood. Oh, we're all frustrated. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've, I've begun to detect that pattern. Um, but, you know, there's a, the point is, look, what is the objective of the exercise? Right. And, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. To Dick's credit, but not just Dick. Right. Like no. To, 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 so, to, to, to many people's credit there, they were constantly asking themselves, what is the point of this exercise? Right. And that is like, why, how are we having this conversation about schooling for the fall, fall 2020 in the United States? And no one appears to be asking, what is the point of this exercise? Right. Bra children are not brains in jars. They are not brains in jars. We used to hear this from our idiot colleagues at Evergreen, the faculty colleagues that we had, who basically said, I don't care who they are, what they think when they're outside of school, exactly what John Taylor Gatto was complaining about, right? All I, you know, they are, these students are effectively brains and jars. No, they're not. No one is. We live in meat space and it's more than living in meat space. We, we are 
interfacing with the world through our senses and through hearing and smell and 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 audition and through touch and you can't learn entirely through a screen yeah you well, can't do it you, we also just completely botched the motivational aspect yes um, so you know the the reason i ended up the way i did was because school provides no useful model for motivation you found self-motivation because you were good at the job in school it wasn't what you were about but mm -hmm. The fact that you could get a reward from school for learning things that were totally worth learning mm -hmm. made it uh, functional, motivationally. For me, I wasn't able to get that. So all my experience at school was just constantly being slapped by it. Now, that wrecks some people. Mm -hmm. In my case, I was able to find other things that were rewarding enough to get me to do them that were actually educational, but it didn't fit. You know, school kept asking, well, how are you doing on the assignment? And the answer was, well, I'm not doing the assignment. And so the answer is failure, dumb track, all that stuff. And, and, and exactly this, right? So it's not, school is carrot and stick model. But in your case, the stick didn't kill you. And in my case, the carrot wasn't the reward I was looking for. The carrot that I, that I got, the actual reward was, oh, I got whatever the opposite of dumb tracking is. And uh, I got into classes that were amazing. You know, why do I have this pile of books from 10th grade where I was reading Mao and Lenin and Marx and Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and all of this? And, you know, uh, you know, people who were dumb tracked were being forced to learn what a preposition was. Does it really matter what a preposition is? I never had to do that. Yeah. And the, you know, the fact is that I got exposed to the great ideas and terrible ideas of the great thinkers throughout history, while people who were just as capable were being forced to rote memorize rules of grammar, which of course you're going to hate school if that's what you're being exposed to.